Welcome to Debrec Australia. I'm Heidi Stroud-Watts in Sydney. We're counting down to Asia's major market opens. I'm Annabelle Droolers in Hong Kong and the top stories this hour. A positive mood for the Asia Open as the US inflation gauge slowdown reinforces bets on Fed cuts as early as September. Wall Street stocks closing at fresh record highs while bond yields retreat. Japan's mega banks forecasting record net income as the BOJ moves away from negative rates, seeing a combined windfall of $21 billion. And more big China tech earnings on the way. We'll preview JD.com and Baidu's results with Bloomberg Intelligence seeing pressure on profits. Take a look at how we're setting up this Thursday session here in Asia. Set to rally after U.S. stocks and bonds climbed on, of course, indications of slowly but surely slowing inflation data from that CPI print. Really, the takeaway was that potentially this provides the Fed with a little bit more room to start easing sooner, even as we've heard from Jay Powell that in the face of lacking evidence of disinflationary pressures that we may be staying higher for longer. Uh, but it is a pretty robust setup. We're seeing Sydney futures up by about six tenths of one percent. We're seeing a pop when it comes to trading uh, in New Zealand underway as well, and Nikkei futures looking uh, pretty perky there as well. We did see gains uh, of over 1% for US stocks and fresh highs for uh, each benchmark there as well. Watching Hong Kong as they resume trading on Thursday after the holidays, South Korea also coming online after that Buddha's birthday holiday there as well. We're continuing to watch when it comes to uh, some of these commodity sensitive uh, names given the huge rally that we've seen across various commodities as well as those that might be Bell more sensitive to that news flow out of China, that consideration perhaps of uh, local governments buying unsold homes, uh, that's been playing out when it comes to sentiment both in China but also across some Australian assets as well. Yeah, Heidi, I think you said it there, record, record, record. I mean, we're, we're now notching a fresh record high for the 23rd time for the S&P 500 just this year alone. Uh, so taking a look at how U.S. futures are coming online this morning, and again, uh, fairly steady right now, but we are above that key 5,300 mark for the S&P 500. As you said, it really was a cross-asset rally, so you saw as well the fear gauge, uh, the VIX, uh, sinking toward its lowest since December of last year. You've got VIX futures there as well. Uh, again, fairly steady at this point in time. But Treasuries, as you said, climbing across the curve. Fed swaps, they're, they're pricing in a faster pace of policy easing. The dollar as well falling. Uh, not just the US inflation data, but uh, separate retail sales data as well, indicating some softening here of resilient consumer demand that had been bolstering the economy. So let's get more on this now with our global economics correspondent, Ender Curran. And Ender, uh, it seems like this is sort of the scenario that traders wanted to see, but from the economist's perspective, uh, what was your key takeaway? Well, it was the smallest gain for core inflation, the smallest month-on-month -month gain this year. It was also the slowest annualised gain in core inflation for three years. So that's kind of a, a good headline suggesting inflation is heading in the right direction. When you look into the details of it, uh, car insurance is still a big standout uh, uh, contributor of obviously shelter costs remain uh, very sticky in terms of inflation costs and then on the downside there was some relief from uh, used cars on airfares on furnishings you know so the takeaway is it was a better than a, broadly better than expected inflation number suggesting that perhaps the disinflation story isn't totally gone away but there's a lot of caution around this it's only one month of reading people are still getting hurt hard in the pocket where it counts and overall inflation remains quite high so yes it has put some fire under the debate that the fed may uh, have an opportunity to cut rates this year but as you both mentioned earlier in the, in the show there, the Fed have been talking very carefully about the disinflation story. They're trying to manage expectations on, on rate cuts. These, this set of numbers today were probably a good set of numbers overall, but it's still a long way to go, I think, on the US interest rate and inflation debate. And quite a bit of inflation and risk continuing to emerge, right? Commodities hitting the highest in a year. Uh, we've got potential more geopolitical concerns as well as, of course, going into the election. We've already seen, we've kind of been talking about, you know, whether these tariffs are going to have uh, inflationary impact as well. The Fed would not be in a hurry to be easing, despite the exuberance that we see across the market reaction. No, there's no rush, and they're making that clear, Heidi. I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty here. As you say, you know, the second half of last year, the story was, look, inflation's slowing dramatically, and this whole disinflation narrative took off. That was fairly well shattered in the first three months of this year, and there's still plenty of hot 
sticky inflation left in the system that needs to work its way out. Then, of course, you go into the policy uncertainty. Uh, you know, less than six months out from the election now, we have very hawkish trade policies on both sides, not least with tariffs going on on goods. A lot of economists say that's inflationary. A lot of focus and scrutiny still on the role of fiscal policy. And of course, the ongoing geopolitical supply chain story hasn't gone away either. So there's plenty of near-term cyclical and longer-term uh, structural issues for the Fed to worry about. But domestically, there are some signs, though, that the economy is cooling. Retail sales today soared than expected. Consumer sentiment also softening. Uh, and so if the jobs market turns sooner, that might put a different uh, hue on the overall inflation debate here. Yeah, that's what I wanted to ask about, Ender, those, those retail sales that we had out uh, talking about that sort of weakness. We're seeing household debt as well reaching a record high. So when do we need to be concerned that the, the optimism around this sort of slowdown in inflation just also translates into a, a, a broader economic slowdown and that really becomes a, a, the bigger focus? Well, we're getting evidence of a slowdown at the margins, and about no doubt about it. The retail sales data for April that came out this morning suggesting a pullback on discretionary spending in particular. So people are mostly spending on gasoline and on food. That's always an indicator is that they are pulling back their, their spending. I think 7 out of 13 of the categories in total showed some kind of a decline. Those soft retail sales numbers coming in the back of the weakening consumer sentiment and on the back of the Fed data that you mentioned that's speaking to a record household debt, throw in then signs of labour market cooling. Uh, and broadly speaking, it looks like the US economy is slowing down, but that's where the debate gets really hard, of course, in terms of the economy right now is in a fairly good spot. It's probably as good as the Fed would have hoped for. Call it soft landing, Goldilocks, Goldilocks, whichever you wish. And, of course, plenty of people will remind you that retail sales are coming off a fairly high base, as is, you know, broadly speaking, the rest of the economy. The key question is where it's going to go in the second half of this year. All the indicators are now that it's going to slow down. The question will be how much of a slowdown. And, of course, that will take on political significance as it heads into those elections in November. A global economics correspondent, Ender Curran, there uh, with a look at the data overnight. Uh, we did also hear from Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari in a discussion on the restrictiveness of monetary policy, and he reiterated his view that the Fed might need to keep rates where they are for a while. How much downward pressure is monetary policy putting on the economy? That's an unknown. We don't know for sure. And that tells me we probably need to sit here for a while longer until we figure out where underlying inflation is headed before we jump to any conclusions. Let's bring in Katie Kaminsky, who's a Chief Research Strategist and Portfolio Manager at Alpha Simplex Group. Katie, great to have you with us. So uh, do you see the market getting a little bit carried away with this idea that, you know, one softer read in six months does not a change in the trajectory make? That's a really good point, because, I mean, obviously the reaction today was very positive. And I'm not saying that it's po like completely a positive scenario yet, because one day is just one data point. But in general, I think what we're seeing is a much more bifurcated view when you look cross-asset. So long-term themes are very bullish on equities, but at the same time, you're still seeing short signals and in fixed income indicating higher for longer. And also the commodity moves have really been at the center of focus. Take a look at gold today, look at copper recently. Those are definitely not trends in the direction that we're done and getting to two anytime soon. So in that sense, how would you be investing around particularly the growth sensitive, the rate sensitive sectors at the moment? It, it, it's sort of a, a great deal of exuberance that we're seeing here. Yes, and I think you see that reaction in equities, and I think bonds has been a very tricky call. Every time we've had this type of indication that things are getting better, you start to see yields definitely starting to go down, but we really do probably have to wait for some time. So really thinking to position based on higher for longer, at least over the next couple of months, and taking advantage of higher rates when, they, when, when you have that pop-up in yields, um, if you do believe that at some point those rates will have to normalize. The, the, the commodity view as well, because you mentioned there those moves that we've seen in gold and the run-up in copper as well, are you concerned about that adding to the inflationary backdrop and also how are you investing around that? Yes. I mean, I think the biggest issue with commodities, they're often the first driver of eventual price movement in goods at 
the consumer end eventually. So they start as a first indicator to where uh, prices might be going. And the fact that commodities bottomed in February, particularly the metals and energies, we're now starting to see a little bit of turnaround as well in the agricultural uh, sector. So one needs to watch corn prices, wheat prices, and other raw um, food prices that would eventually trickle in if we started to see that trend reverse as well. So disinflation is definitely not observable in the commodity sectors, and that eventually has ramifications um, for the economy as a whole and also eventually prices. We're seeing record highs around, well, the U.S., of course, but also Europe, markets in Asia. Is this an environment where you want to turn to places that have cheaper valuations like China? This is a good point because signals in, in, in the um, EM sector as well as China have been much more neutral until recently. And there's a chance that you might potentially see some recovery. I know that China has been up about 18 percent since it's bottom in February. So there is some potential for rotation, uh, particularly just given the high valuations and the potential for upside risk in inflation could sort of dampen the exuberance that we're seeing right now in some of the sectors that have outperformed. Japan as well has been one of the best performers this year. Um, we'll have to watch policy there and see if that continues to be the case. So it could definitely be a time for some rotation. That was Katie Kaminsky there, Chief Research Strategist at Alpha Simplex Group. Thanks very much for your insights. And uh, you can get a roundup of the stories that you need to know to get your day going in today's edition of Daybreak. Of course, really that big focus today on U.S. inflation, retail sales fueling those Fed easing bets. But you can get it uh, on DB Go. It's also available on mobile in the Bloomberg Anywhere app. You can customize your settings so you only get news on the industries and the assets that you care about. More ahead. This is Bloomberg. season is here. This is a get out the popcorn moment. And across the board, just pummeling of expectations. Earnings matter. That's really clear. Bloomberg is first to break the numbers. Hey folks, we've got Microsoft. Apple earnings crossing the wire. Alphabet. Wow, coming in way above expectations. Hertz driving in the opposite direction. And lost still to come. With the smartest insights. Let's just kind of damned if they do and damned if they don't. Is this their iPhone moment? I view this as Operation Kick the Can to August. Continuing coverage on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. Russian President Vladimir Putin has arrived in China on the first foreign trip of his new term. It underlines the importance of his relationship with Beijing as Russian forces press forward with a new offensive in Ukraine. Our chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Engel is here with the details. And Steve, it's sort of become a tradition of sorts that they start a new presidential term, sure. each visits each other's country. So is this more symbolic or is there something really important and vital uh, for this specific visit? I think it's absolutely vital for Vladimir Putin. Absolutely. I mean, uh, Russia, uh, excuse me, China has proven to be the vital um, lifeline, if you will, as the war heads into its, uh, deep into its third year now. And again, Moscow relies on Beijing for the overwhelming amount of trade and economic support. Uh, I'm not necessarily saying that uh, its products from China are getting, are, are supporting the war, but they have found the dual-use technologies have been finding their way onto the battlefield, whether it's semiconductors, ball bearings, or other equipment uh, and technology. So clearly, Vladimir Putin is going there. Yes, there is a tradition to uh, go to your, your best friend, if you will, with, in which you have a no-limits partnership signed a couple of years ago, uh, moments before, of course, Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine. Uh, but to go there as well to shore up this support, and he has already arrived. I mean, he's an early riser. He gets to Beijing uh, before we got to work this morning. So uh, <laughs> it, it's clearly uh, an indispensable ally, Beijing is. And what will be interesting as well is what will be the messaging coming from Xi Jinping as this war does go into its third year. And, you know, the, the pressure from the United States has been ramped up on potential sanctions on Chinese banks for potentially supporting indirectly or directly the war in Ukraine. So that's a de delicate balancing act that uh, Xi Jinping will obviously be uh, walking as well. Mm -hmm.
Ev, you'd imagine there's quite a lot of uh, a variety of asks, right, given that he's bringing with him uh, his new defence chief and his central bank governor? <laughs> There, you just put it right there. I mean, he's bringing his new defense chief, who is an economist by trade, and his central bank governor. So that tells you right there what Vladimir Putin needs. You know, as a student of World War II history, I know exactly what a, a country needs to sustain a prolonged war. You need friends, you need finances, and you need firepower. Now, again, I'm not saying necessarily that... Uh, China is supplying that firepower, but again, the dual-use technologies are finding their way onto the battlefield. And as uh, the key and perhaps main or only uh, diplomatic friend in this uh, world right now, Vladimir Putin needs those finances to continue this war in Ukraine. Uh, and, and, you know, trade between the two countries in 2023 hit a record. No surprise there. $240 billion. Uh, that was more than double what it was in 2020. But we've already started to see, as I talked about those, uh, uh, you know, possible sanctions on Chinese banks, you started to see that trade number come down in April for a second month. Uh, and basically, Russian media has been talking about how, uh, you know, these these transactions have been kind of held up uh, by the Chinese on some electronics and some products since the end of March. Does that indicate there's some hesitancy for the Chinese banks to facilitate this kind of trade under the threat potentially of secondary sanctions from the United States? So that's why this potential meeting is critical because the central bank governor is coming, a new defense chief who is an economist by trade is coming. The speculation is they're going to try to find ways to facilitate and finance this kind of trade, a lifeline for Moscow, uh, at the time of increased threat of sanctions. I was there in Beijing when, when uh, Antony Blinken again reiterated, we are looking at the banks and we will take whatever necessary actions uh, at our hand to, to stop any potential facilitation of the war coming from, from China. So it's absolutely critical for Vladimir Putin to get those finances. There's no limits of friendship. Right, our Chief North Asia correspondent Stephen Angle there covering uh, that meeting and other geopolitical developments today that we're following. The U.S. says it's accelerating arms supplies to Ukraine as the country's military confronts a Russian assault in the northeast. Russian troops are pushing deeper into the Kharkiv region, taking control of some villages close to the border. The offensive is stretching Ukraine's forces and may push Kyiv to redeploy units from the front line to the east. Slovakia's Prime Minister Robert Fico has suffered life-threatening injuries after being shot in public. This is the first assassination attempt on a European leader in more than two decades. The 59-year-old was in hospital in a very serious condition following an attack by a gunman who police say had a clear political motivation. He returned to power last year as a force of opposition to EU institutions in Brussels. The U.S. has warned Israel that it risks creating a power vacuum in Gaza, urging the country's leaders to focus more on post-war planning. Israel's gradual deployment of troops into Rafah appears to be the start of a full-blown invasion in the southern Gaza city. Secretary of State Antony Blinken says the U.S. is worried about the blocking of aid for Palestinian territories. One of the deep concerns that we have uh, is the impact of this limited operation that we've seen to date in Rafa on the ability to provide humanitarian assistance because the two main points of access in the south, uh, Rafa itself and Karem Shalom, have been affected by the, um, uh, by the, the, the resulting conflict. Plenty more to come here on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. Saudi Arabia's sovereign wealth fund has slashed the number of U.S. stocks it reported only at the end of the first quarter. Analysis of the 13F filing shows its U.S. holdings almost halved to $18 billion. Let's get more on this and some of the other revelations. Let's bring our finance editor, Adam Haig. So uh, the, the Saudi PIF changes were particularly of interest? 
Yeah, I think in a couple of senses, Heidi. Firstly, because they are clearly bringing down those direct ownership positions in U.S. equities, which, of course, as we know, hit a fresh record in the U.S. market in the last few hours, and we continue to do that uh, throughout this year, despite all the, you know, the wrangling over the uh, where rates will go. Um, so I think it's interesting that they're doing that, but yet at the same time, they're also kind of getting more into the options overlays and on looking for opportunities for for equities to gain there still. So there is that kind of on the one hand bringing that back down, but also adding to options positions, which still will clearly pay out and will will give them some return um, for upside potential in U.S. stocks. So I don't think it should be seen as a, a, a bearish sign. I think it should be seen as a, a, you know, maybe dialing down some of that risk as we've seen that run up in U.S. equities. Um, but that options side of the equation obviously still allows them to, to benefit quite a bit from the upside. And I think the other thing for the Saudi PIF is just some of those stakes that they've been reducing in as well. Some of those big tech holdings that we know um, that have been so popular, the likes of Amazon, Microsoft and Salesforce, of course, where they've, um, you know, they've edged down and, and, and uh, reduced their, their stakes in. Berkshire, of course, is always one that we watch very closely. What did we find out about what they're doing across financials and for Chubb? Yeah, well, I think the Chubb stake has, you know, it's kind of been in the background. There's been some uh, expectations of it, but they've never kind of crossed that regulatory threshold to have to disclose it. And of course, we now know that that they are there in a, in a reasonable, sizable way. And you saw a, you know, 10 percent appreciation in the in the stock price. So pretty clear how how investors are taking that. But I think the broader uh, finance and banking exposure is still interesting. I mean, given what was said at the the big meeting um, recently about you know cash levels still being very elevated, them still wanting to um, kind of be cautious on on deploying cash in the current environment. I think it's interesting to see that you're still getting these these pretty sizable um, stake increases in certain elements of financials and, and banking, um, which speaks to you know not a huge amount of worry in, in what's going on with the U.S. economy, but clearly uh, some level of fragility still acknowledged there. Um, but clearly not afraid to, when they can be decisive with an investment thesis, to deploy that money and, and go in in a big way, as they've always done historically. We've also seen uh, some interesting moves in terms of what Apollo has been doing. Yeah, and, th and those are really interesting because, mm. as we've seen in, in private equity, you know, the, the, the ability of these big, large um, asset managers in alternatives, um, th th there still is a lot of scope for um, some of those big private equity uh, sell downs that have been kind of like, you know, basically put on the back burner until um, the market improves. A, a lot of that sentiment is still quite cautious. You know, there's still a lot of uh, big firms holding on to big positions and that they don't necessarily want to sell yet. So I think that's a that's a good example there of, uh, you know, them actually wanting to, to make a move. And we'll see how the rest of the year plays out, of course, with the interest rate trajectory still very much in the balance, as we as we know. Um, but maybe if you get to see more of this private equity moving um, and more activity slowly picking up, um, then of course you could lead to, to, to more of these kind of moves that you've seen at Apollo. Finance editor Adam Hay here in Sydney. Bill. Thanks, Heidi. Yeah, just taking a look at how U.S. futures are tracking so far in the session, because as we said, this is a day full of records. We're seeing a lot of markets around globally uh, hitting fresh record highs, and the U.S. is one of them. The S&P 500 touching its 23rd record just this year alone in the session overnight. Big uh, cross-asset rally as well. We saw Treasuries climbing. We saw, we saw the dollar dropping. Uh, these are all supportive factors as we look ahead to the open of Asian markets here. Half an hour out now from the start of trade for Sydney, Seoul and Tokyo. More ahead. This is Bloomberg. Inflation is it's taking its sweet time coming down, but we still think it's a downward trend. The big picture on a core basis is that the rate of inflation has come down a lot. Really great set of data, I think, for the Fed, especially on the inflation front. This, to me, is a, a chair who wants to cut. I think that, and you can easily see one, and I think, 
I think if he has the opening, I think he'll do two. And, and I think data like this, if it persists, I think that, that that'll give him that opening. I don't think July, but I do think September is possible. We need to see more weakening in the data, especially on shelter inflation, for the Fed to begin to get gain confidence and get comfortable in, in terms of uh, beginning to ease rates. The truth is, I don't think that we're heading into a, um, you know, a higher for longer environment. I think we're heading into a normal, normal for, for longer normal, environment. Yes. Some of our guests talking about the latest U.S. inflation print and, and in aggregate it just showed some coolness coming through. Retail sales softening, home builder sentiment waning. These are all the different data sets that gave us more conviction around where the Fed goes from here. More certainty that we're going to be seeing rate cuts. And so this chart here taking a look at the dollar reaction off the back of that because we saw that pullback in Treasury yields. A weaker dollar as well falling below its 200-day moving average. Uh, that weakness very much broad-based. But the big Biggest single day drop for 2024 here. How that's playing out, let's bring it up a chart now and take a look at the currencies in this part of the world as well as the euro, of course, a big component of the dollar gauge or dollar basket. But here you are just seeing, again, a little bit of strength persisting across some of these major counterparts. Uh, keeping an eye, of course, on what happens with the Japanese yen here because you're dropping below that 155 mark. It is that story, perhaps, Heidi, uh, of that, that narrowing yield gap between the BOJ, the Fed, and certainly that plays into the financial system situation in Japan as well. Yeah, watching uh, Japan's mega banks uh, when shares in those lenders start trading in the next hour, they're predicting record profits. Of course, after the BOJ finally ended its negative rate policy, let's bring in more with our Asia investing editor, Russell Ward in Tokyo. So, uh, Russell, what are the highlights that you're expecting? What are you most keenly watching through when it comes to these numbers? Morning, Heidi. Yes, so just to recap, uh, the three mega banks uh, all posted record profits for last fiscal year and forecast a fresh set of re uh, record profits for the coming fiscal year. And this is going to be, of course, the first full year uh, without the uh, dreaded ne negative interest rate policy that's b that banks have hated and has been weighing down on their business for, for seven or eight years. Uh, and they're really in a good situation right now, obviously, with rising rates at home. Uh, they're benefiting from, still benefiting from high rates abroad. Um, and this buoyant uh, stock market here in Japan. Japan, Japanese banks have been selling their cross shareholdings. They've pledged to sell more of those and they're actually booking uh, healthy gains on those uh, sales uh, because of the, the buoyant stock market here. Um, and also, you know, the bank CEOs, when they spoke at their briefings, they were really um, tarting the fact that they have been diversifying their businesses away from just pure lending uh, into areas like investment banking. Uh, Mizuhol CEO talked about uh, investment banking in the US doing very well, so they're getting more fee business, uh, and so they're really in a, in a good situation right now. If they're in a good situation, how does that also translate into shareholder returns? And are shareholders going to be satisfied, for instance, with the buybacks that have been announced? Yeah, that's a good question, and we'll find out uh, in about half an hour uh, when the stocks start trading. Um, you know, Mitsubishi UFJ and Sumitomo Mitsui both announced buybacks of around 100 billion yen, um, which are probably a, a little bit on the small side, particularly with MUFG. One analyst, uh, it's SMBC Nikko, said the, the, the size of the MS, MUFG buyback was a negative surprise. Uh, and then Mizuho uh, refrained from... Uh, uh, well, they held off on buybacks entirely this time, but that was actually to be expected because their capital situation isn't quite as high uh, as the other two banks. So, um, yeah, quite modest buybacks, but I think there'll probably be more to come uh, as the year progresses. So we'll just have to see how shareholders digest uh, this first round. Russell, were there any downsides to the results? Yeah, I would say probably downside risks. Um, the one, one downside is the fact that uh, the Japan stock market rally has actually stalled a bit lately. Uh, you know, the stocks reached a record in March, but really haven't moved uh, that much since then. So that might limit the gains that they make from cross shareholdings and limit sort of the trading activity domestically. Another risk is, um, of course, uh, if uh, interest rates start falling, if and when. Uh, rates start falling uh, abroad, um, you know, that will uh, sort of limit their uh, interest income uh, prospects uh, on that front. So those are a couple of downside risks. And of course, you know, geo geopolitics, the CEOs uh, spoke of those as being risks, but I think that's a risk for, for any corporate, um, you know, in this current environment.
All right, we'll see how those stocks start to trade at the open in just under half an hour's time. That's our Asia Investing Editor, Russell Ward, there in Tokyo. And sticking with the earnings theme, because Chinese tech reporting continues this week, uh, Baidu and JD.com, they're due with their numbers later Thursday. Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Asia-Pacific Consumer Analyst Catherine Lim joins us now for a preview. And uh, Catherine, I think, again, we're, we're making comparisons just based on the fact they're reporting on the same day. But if you were to look at both of those companies, it seems like that concern across them is that there's going to be that pressure on profits. Yes, for both companies indeed, Annabelle, um, Baidu as well as JD.com. I think for Baidu itself, it's going to be another set of underwhelming um, results from the companies. Um, particularly, just bear in mind that, you know, AI is going to still remain unprofitable, even though the company is probably going to update the market on developments there. JD.com, the retail business itself, we're expecting lower profitability, especially as we step into, you know, their upcoming um, six month eight shopping festival. Uh, we're going to continue to actually see the competition and we've actually seen it from Alibaba. They are going all out to actually get back e-commerce market share. So JD.com, um, they're going to face the pressure on the profit front from that. Catherine, what are you watching when it comes to uh, Baidu? Right. Um, clearly, you know, I think all eyes are on their AI developments um, and whether, you know, there's going to be more updates um, on that. Um, again, bear in mind that, you know, we're going to continue to actually see um, the company coming on the heads on from competition, um, you know, with Tencent, Alibaba, as well as, um, you know, Huawei from that perspective. So we're going to actually see whether, you know, they've got anything, um, you know, exciting to actually update the market um, later tonight. It, you mentioned JD.com and that, that competition it's in with Alibaba, and Alibaba's aggressively trying to get back its market share, and JD.com's had to try and fend that off with, with lots of different measures, things like free, free delivery, free return. Is that going to work, do you think? And, and what are the options here? Do they just have to continue trying to push back on that pressure? Sure. We've, we've actually seen some signs of that um, coming through. Um, you know, one of their entities, which does on-demand, very speedy delivery in China, they've actually, um, you know, cited that there was a doubling of on-demand orders on JD's um, ads in April. So, um, you know... Slight positive signs, and again, um, you know, these moves and these orders could have come on the back of, you know, costlier investments from JD.com. In fact, we've actually seen them lowering the bar for free deliveries to be done, um, you know, in 2024. So um, let's see how it actually impacts their profits um, tonight. Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Analyst for the Asia-Pacific Consumer, Catherine Lim there. Uh, some of the other corporate stories that we're tracking today, some shareholders in BHP and Anglo-American are expected to expect the takeover saga to continue. They've told Bloomberg there's room for a sweet and third offer from BHP before a regulatory deadline on May 22nd. Anglo has rejected BHP's previous all-share approaches and announced a revamp that includes exiting diamonds, platinum and coal. Paramount is said to have had discussions with Amazon about expanding ties between their media businesses. Paramount has been struggling with falling ad sales and money-losing streaming businesses. It's fielding takeover offers from independent producer David Ellison as well as Apollo Global Management. Bloomberg has learned that HSBC is leaning towards appointing its next CEO from a short list of internal candidates. According to sources, the lender sees CFO Georges Alhendry and wealth and personal banking head Nuno Matos as leading replacements for Noel Quinn. We're told HSBC has engaged an external recruitment firm to benchmark them against external candidates for the role. Well, Bridgewater CEO is warning investors against becoming overconfident in their positions as geopolitical risks weigh on markets around the world. Nia Bardea spoke to us at the Qatar Economic Forum. What environments is your portfolio going to perform well in and what is it not going to perform well in? And then stress test it. Literally say, hey, you know, what if policy is going to stay tighter? What if inflation is going to remain higher? What if U.S. outperformance will not persist? What will happen with my portfolio? And then measure that against your goals, because every investor has specific goals in their portfolios. And, and close those gaps by doing one of three things, basically. Either shift your allocations, shift within your allocations, so you can stay allocated to equities in the same way, but choose the equities that perform more in the ways that you want relative to your goals, relative yeah. to how you stress in your portfolios. 
and or create return streams that specifically address the problems that you are worried about. So you can hedge tail risk, you can do other things. That's what we do at Bridgewater. I mean, we spend a lot of time, including with clients here, um, talking to them about their portfolio, stress testing it, and then making sure that we create solutions at the total portfolio level to kind of address There's one really obvious thing that over all that period, one reason why people have done very well is if you simply bought six American tech stocks, <laughs> and under your, I'm just, just to push you on that, under your thing that the new normal won't be the same, that would imply, to me at least, that maybe, it's, maybe those U.S. tech stocks won't do as well over the next decade as they have over the past period. Your big point, I could not agree with more. Yeah. Uh, the, and I, this is what I meant in the beginning. The previous decade was like a straight flush for investors. It, you dropped, a, not just in the U.S., you dropped the dollar basically almost anywhere, and you yeah. do well. And it could be uh, U.S. tech stocks. It could be other things. I agree that uh, you should be open to a much wider uh, range of outcomes uh, and assume that you're going to be wrong. Even Bridgewater, we have 400 people spending day in and day out mapping cause-effect linkages in the world, and we still get 40% of our calls wrong. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to acknowledge the fact that you're going to be wrong a lot and just make sure you're building a resilient portfolio, which you really didn't quite need in the previous decade, but you will need in the next decade. Bridgewater CEO Nia Badea speaking with Bloomberg's ex uh, editor-in-chief, John Micklethwaite, at the Qatar Economic Forum. Well, take a look at the setup after record after record after record, almost across the breadth of asset classes. This is how we're approaching the start of trading of major markets here in Asia. Very robust setup here in Sydney, six tenths of 1% higher. We're seeing some pretty muted gains trading uh, across the Kiwi session already. And Chicago and UK futures are looking pretty strong as we're really set to mirror that US rally. Uh, as expectations of slowing inflation, slowing consumer inflation uh, for the first time in six months will give the Fed a bit more leeway to cut rates sooner rather than later. But of course, if you take a look at that super core reading as opposed to headline, there are still complicating factors in terms of the stickier aspects of inflation. And of course, at a time where we're also seeing commodities trading at the highest in over a year as well. So all of this, uh, a pretty mixed picture, but it does look like we're setting up for overall a bullish start to trading this Thursday. We're also getting uh, Hong Kong as well as Korean markets coming back online after the Buddha's birthday. More ahead here on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. You're watching Daybreak Australia. Some political news we're following this morning in the U.S. will send a delegation to Taiwan for the inauguration of President-elect Lai ching -te. Washington says the visit is in keeping with its long-standing practice of sending former officials to support a democratic electoral process. Lai's election this year was a setback in Chinese President Xi Jinping's ambitions for more influence over the self-governing island. Singapore's new Prime Minister Lawrence Wong is warning of a riskier and more violent world as he officially takes the helm of the city-state. Wong says Singapore should brace for new realities as great powers compete to shape a new global order. He says Singapore will continue to engage with both the US, its largest foreign investor, and China, which is, Heidi, its biggest trading partner. Indonesia's president-elect says he wants the country to become the world's fastest growing economy early in his term. Speaking exclusively with Bloomberg at the Qatar Economic Forum, Prabowo Subianto told us about his priorities when he takes over in October from Joko Widodo. I'm determined to build on that foundation and my uh, core focus will be first on uh, food uh, security. Indonesia must be self-sufficient in food and then uh, energy security, energy self-sufficiency. And uh, we are determined to bring down poverty uh, in a massive uh, campaign, massive effort. Uh, I'm determined to uh, get rid of hunger amongst uh, our people, especially the young. And uh, in the end, we have to uh, concentrate on 
processing our natural resources. We have to uh, make a great effort in downstreaming uh, and to industrialize. And all of this needs good governance. I'm determined to cut down corruption, uh, waste, and with that, we are very confident, we are very bullish, we are very determined uh, to bring this all about. All very ambitious if you want to do it within your first term, which is five years. Can you achieve a growth target of beyond 5% in order for you to fulfill what you have set out to do? In my conversation with Bapa Jokowi Dodo, he said that he's laid the foundation, he's implemented all the policies, put in place infrastructure needed for Indonesia to grow at 7%. Can you achieve 7% or more in the five years of government? I'm very confident. I've talked to my experts. I've studied the figures. I'm very confident we can easily achieve 8% and I am determined to go beyond. 8% within the five years, the first year, second year, and when you go beyond, are you looking at double digits? I, I, I would say within two, three years, yes. You, very, talk, very, very you talked about downstreaming. Part. What are the other growth drivers for you? Or would downstreaming be key to you achieving 7, 8, 9% growth? Uh, downstreaming will take several years. What will uh, be a growth driver in the first years will be our uh, concentration on uh, agriculture, food, uh, food production, food distribution, and uh, energy. Uh, we want to go green in a very quick way. We want to produce our diesel from uh, palm oil. And this uh, will be a very strong growth drive, uh, driver. Uh, you know, we import $20 billion every year for diesel oil. So can you imagine uh, the savings we will have when we will switch to biofuel? I want to touch on your spending plans. When you campaign, you talked about how you want to provide free lunches, free milk for students, and some are questioning how you will pay for such a program. Can you fund that program if you're unable to perhaps raise the limit of your budget deficit beyond 3%? You've said you can. We have uh, studied this. We have... Uh what do you call it? We, we studied all the figures, and we are very confident we can do that. We are very confident we can do that. And, uh, this While keeping your budget deficit at 3%? Yes, 3%. And you know, the 3% is, is something arbitrary. Not many countries uh, hold to that. But uh, we have a tradition of prudent fiscal management. I think we have the lowest... Uh, debt to GDP uh, figure in, in, in the world, one of the lowest. And uh, so now I think it's time to be a bit more uh, daring within good governance. That was Indonesia's president-elect Prabowo Subianto with Bloomberg. Says Linda, I'm in there and we've just got some breaking news that's crossed the terminal here. Japanese GDP figures coming out and these are really undershooting economists' expectations. So for first quarter GDP dropping 2% on an annualised basis and that is, again, far past economists that we'd surveyed who were seeing contraction of negative 1.2%. So what's really driving that? There's a couple of different factors that are coming out of the numbers here. Firstly, you've got spending by consumers. That's dropping. We actually saw private consumption falling more than expected. Spending by companies is falling as well. Business spending, again, contracted more than had been expected. This is not a great outlook here. Again, part of the reason for the contraction, perhaps the third one, is we actually saw auto exports weakening because we had that verification scandal that erupted at the Toyota subsidiary Daihatsu during the first quarter as well. So, Heidi, not numbers that the BOJ really wants to see.
Uh, take a look at what we're watching, Bell, when it comes to trading in Australia. Uh, as we set up uh, the cash open in just about nine minutes' time, we are seeing pretty strong uh, risk appetite, of course, just really uh, mirroring the uh, the efforts that we saw over uh, overnight on the Wall Street session. Of course, record after record when it comes to benchmarks at fresh highs for both the Nasdaq 100 and the S&P 500. And we're seeing uh, the prospect of some pretty hefty gains in the Asian session as well. Uh, Eight-tenths of one percent is how we're sitting when it comes to Sydney futures. Futures. We've also got uh, some gains when it comes to uh, Aussie bonds there as well. And we're also watching the Aussie dollar. 67 is where we're at. Of course, some of the positive news flow, the hopes of uh, potentially more uh, stronger, I should say, action when it comes to the property market in China has been passing through to Aussie assets, the likes of uh, the currency as well as some of the, uh, the other proxies, including the iron ore price there as well. That rally that we're seeing across Australian bonds also being seen across the Kiwi bonds as well, following those. Uh, gains in treasuries. We saw yields being pushed uh, lower really across the board there. More ahead here on Daybreak Australia. This is Bloomberg. The latest delivery data uh, for oil demand, especially in Europe, but also in the United States and, and other major uh, economies, came in really weak in the first quarter. And as you noted, um, it's weak industrial activity that is driving this uh, in, in Europe in particular, but also warm weather, a second warm winter here in Europe. The IEA oil market division head, Toro Bossoni, there. This, as we see, really commodities uh, rallying across the board. A lot of this being driven by the recent gains that we've seen across copper. Of course, that short squeeze really being uh, seen there in the last few sessions. The highest levels that we've seen in about a year. We're seeing iron ore up by about six tenths of a percent. And also, we're seeing this kind of recent, uh, nascent recovery again in iron ore with these headlines of Bloomberg reporting that potentially Beijing is considering allowing local governments to buy up. Uh, unsold homes to try and absorb some of the uh, inventory glut that we've seen and that's been passing through uh, to in fact the prices of the steel making ingredient there. The copper short squeeze I mentioned being felt across the global market there as well. We're also seeing oil ticking higher on uh, a decline in US uh, stockpiles as well as just a broader risk on mood right. Signs of ebbing US inflation are really passing through across many many asset classes. The market opens in Sydney, Seoul and Tokyo next.